Good morning. A couple of announcements for you today. The first one is following the service today, immediately after the service, there's going to be a children's ministry meeting in Life Learning One. Be brief, we won't keep you too long, but this is to give you an idea of how things are going to look going forward as we take a look at reopening the Sunday morning children's ministry. So if you have been involved in this in the past, if you were involved before we got shut down, and you want to get back into it, or if you've never been involved in it and you want to get involved, this is for you. I really encourage you to, to stop by. I think it's going to be really helpful, really informational. And so that is immediately following the service downstairs in Life Learning One. And the second announcement is going to come to us from Mr. Ray. Mr. Ray. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Next week, ladies and gentlemen, for the last 10 weeks, men here and at other churches have been going through a program called Fight Club. 10 weeks of transformation through physically, relation, but most importantly, spiritual transformation. Getting closer to one another, to God, to their wives. Next week, we, uh, we finalize that with our graduation. So you are cordially invited, please, everyone, next week, 3 p.m., right here at the church, celebrate the graduation of the men who worked so hard to get through this, this whole 10-week experience to get closer to God our Father. Amen. Thank you, Ray. Please stand, and we'll go to the Lord in prayer. Father, thank you for this day that you have given us, Lord. Thank you for the blessing of another week. Father, as we move into this season, we celebrate and reflect on the birth of your son. We think about what he did in this world. We think about the salvation that's possible because of his work on the cross. Lord, help us to receive these wondrous truths with an open heart, with an open mind. Lord, help us to grasp the beauty of the gospel and the beauty of your word and the beauty of your son and his work. We thank you for this reality. We thank you for sending Jesus into the world to pay the penalty for our sins. Lord, help us to acknowledge this. Help us to tell people about this, to encourage each other, to lift each other up. Lord, open our hearts to hear and receive the message this morning and to apply it this coming week. We thank you so much for everything that you've done for us, Lord. We thank you for your many blessings, and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.
Welcome to a place that's more than a church. Wave to your neighbors this morning.
I've been held in your hands From the moment that I wake up Until I lay my head I will sing of the goodness of God In all my life you have been faithful In all my life you have the goodness of God. I love your voice. You have led me through the fire. In darkest night, you were close like no other. I've known you as a father. I've known you as a friend. And I have lived in the goodness of God And all my life you have been faithful And all my life you have been so, so good With every breath that I am able I will sing of the goodness of God. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. With my life laid down, I surrender now. I give you everything. Your goodness is running this opportunity, Lord, that we have to come and to lift up your name. Lord, we worship you, we praise you, we honor you. You are worthy of our praise.
And all God's people said, Amen. You may be seated. Guess what? Kids, you can come up. Come on. It's been forever. Not you. <laughs> come on. Come on, come on, come on, come on. Got to be some kids here. How many are here? Just one. Oh. Somebody's an old kid. You're a child of God. How spiritual. Hey, come here. These are the Advent candles. You know what Advent means? Advent means a promised coming. And Jesus promised that He would come. Now, He's going to promise that He comes twice. He came the first time in a little town called Bethlehem. That's right. The second time He comes, all the world will see Him. And it'll be an exciting time. But our very first candle that we light is called the candle of hope. When we look at the candle of hope, we remember the wonder and the promise and the hope of Jesus that He gives to all of us. And one of our favorite songs we like to sing for the candle of hope is Away in a Manger. Do you know that song? A little bit? Mike knows it, but we're not going to let him sing it. <laughs> Let's all sing it together. Amen? Away in a manger, no crib for a bed. The little Lord Jesus laid down His sweet head. The stars in the sky looked down where He lay. The little Lord Jesus asleep on the hay. Thank you, Lord, for the promise and the hope that is ours in Christ Jesus. May you encourage every heart. May you bless us as we gather together in the name of Jesus and in your word. For these are the things we ask in his holy and his precious name. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. Now don't go anywhere. You can get more than one. Mike? Okay. All right. Thank you very much. You can go back and be seated. Brave soul. An extremely brave soul. Well, we're going to continue today in the Gospel of John. Uh, we're actually going to continue in the Feast of Tabernacles. Remember last week we talked about the Feast of Tabernacles. Whether you know it or not, the Feast of Tabernacles was actually the Jewish celebration of Thanksgiving. That was their Thanksgiving time. And God had commanded that when they got together, they were to celebrate. They were not to be in their homes, but they were to live in booths or tents that were outside of the house. Many of them would go up on the roof of their homes if they had those flat roofs and they would build a booth there and that's where they would stay during the course of the week. But regardless... They were to celebrate and to have joy all the time. The scripture says, the Lord says, I command you that you will have joy all this week. And so that's what it was all about. And you know, Jesus, he didn't go down the first several days that were there, but he did show up near the end of the week. And as he showed up near the end of the week, I had shared with you last time how that on the sixth day, where well, they had seven days, the festival actually lasted eight days. And you say, well, how come? Sabbath. Because it started on a Sabbath and it ended on a Sabbath, but it was a high Sabbath, so there was an extra day there that was, direct, that was given to the celebration as well, and people hung around for that. And so on the seventh day, one of the things that the high priest would do is he would go all down to the pool of Siloam, and they would gather a great jar of water, and they would come up, and every day they did this, they poured the water on the, 
altar of sacrifice. And thereby they started new flames each day. And then at the end of the day, they would do that. But on the seventh day, they would actually march around it seven times and then pour the water on there. It was at that point that Jesus said, I am the water of life. Now, just before he came to Jerusalem, if you'll recall the story where he fed the 5,000 plus men and women with five loaves and two fishes, he said, I am the bread of life. Now he says, I am the water of life. And when you drink from me, you will never thirst. And so he talked about that at that point. Today, we're going to pick the story up where we left it last week. Let's say our prayer together. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. I therefore boldly declare that God loves me, that Jesus died for me, and that the Spirit will guide me in all truth. I come now to hear God's holy word. I will let it be a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path, that I might be everything God created me to be in Jesus' name. Father, I pray that every distraction would be removed from hearts and minds, that you would open our hearts, that we would fully comprehend and understand the wonder of who you are. Lord Jesus, may you be glorified as we lift up your name and Holy Spirit move among us that we might truly sense your presence and know your wondrous care and watch over us. Thank you for this holy word and this beautiful story we look at today. In Jesus' precious name, amen. I thought of naming this message, Dying from Embarrassment and Living to Tell About It. Anybody ever been there? <clears throat> when we look at this passage of scripture that's here, it's called Finding Grace at your worst moment. There are times in your life where it's absolutely the worst moment. It's the most embarrassing time in your life. How many of y'all have ever been embarrassed? How many of y'all have been embarrassed spiritually? Oh, you see, when we look at our life, we understand that there are different elements. And what we're going to do today is we're going to talk about what takes place here immediately after Jesus had declared that he was the water of life. Now let's pick it up if we would and look at this transgression caught in the act. John 8, 1 through 4. But Jesus, this was right after everybody's doing their thing. Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. Now the Mount of Olives was to the east of the city of Jerusalem, up on a hill about halfway between Jerusalem and Bethany where Jesus often stayed. As a matter of fact, this Mount of Olives would be a place he would go to numerous times. But here, the scripture says he went to the Mount of Olives, and then at dawn, he appeared again in the temple courts. Guess where Jesus' tent or booth was? At the Mount of Olives. That's where he went. The scripture doesn't say he went into any home or anything. He went up there for the night, and that's where he slept. That's where his tabernacle was, his booth. And so the scripture says... In the morning at dawn, he appeared again in the temple courts where all the people gathered around him and he sat down to teach them. Then the teachers of the law and the Pharisees brought in a woman caught in adultery. Caught in the act is the literal translation. She was caught in the act of adultery. They made her stand before the group and said to Jesus, Teacher, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. Now, I know some of you are looking, that's a terrible sin. I got news for you. All sin is terrible. Does not make any difference. So don't get hung up on the nature of her sin. Because everything that we're going to learn about today is going to talk about sin. And all of us have sin. And all God's people said, Amen. we all sin. <clears throat> Even Paul the Apostle, in present tense indicative, he wrote this right then in his life. He said, I am finding myself not doing the things that I know I should do and doing the things that I know I should not do. He even understood the gravity and the nature of this. Even in the Bible in numerous places, Paul again said, I am the cheapest among all sinners. He didn't say I was the cheapest. He said, I am the cheapest. And then when you look into the Word of God, 
in 1 John, John the Apostle says, we are not without sin. If you say you're without sin, you're a liar and the truth is not in you. We all have sin. And he wasn't talking to unbelievers. He was talking to believers. What that tells me is that you and I are sinful. We have our sin forgiven, but we still walk in the muck. Amen? And so here we are, and we struggle with this. And this woman, even though she was a Jew, they would not have any recourse to be able to do anything about her. She was a Jewish woman who understood Jewish law. She understood who God was and the nature of God. She understood all these things because she had grown up in a Jewish home. And yet here she was, she's caught in the midst of this sin. Now, <coughs> you and I have been caught numerous times. One time I got caught saying something I shouldn't say and I had to eat soap. My mama said, you just had something in your mouth I wouldn't hold in my hand. That went right over your head, didn't it? She made me eat soap. I won't say that I never said a bad word again, but I never said it in front of my mama. <laughs> Amen? <clears throat> when we look at life, we understand there are different times we get caught. We get caught getting in the cookie jar. We get caught doing this. We get caught doing that. We get caught going out. My son one time got in trouble because he was out with a group of friends, and they got in trouble. And he said, but Dad, my friends don't, don't mean to get in trouble. And I said, yes, yeah, son. The problem is, it's not that they don't mean to get in trouble. It's that they don't mean not to get into trouble. That's the problem. And so in the context of that, we all find ourselves in moments of sin. What I want to do is share with you a little bit about how you and I deal with sin that we've been caught in. Anybody ever been caught? Ooh, some of you are not raising your hands, but I know better. Uh-huh. First of all, we can blame others. Number one way that we deal with, with sin in which we've been caught is we blame someone else. In my house, whenever there was something that went wrong, there was these guys that lived there. I never saw them, but they lived in my home. I don't know. Do you know that one? We knew. I don't know. He lived in my home. I have no idea. Wasn't me. I, that guy lived in our house too. Amen. How many of y'all know that guy? Wasn't me. And then the third one was they did it and they never pointed to who they just said they I said who's they we don't know but they lived in our house too you know nonetheless we like to blame others now <clears throat> we like to blame others in this passage in Jude chapter 1 verse 16 by the way Jude was the half brother of Jesus the scripture says this these people these are the people who always get caught okay these people always complain and what? Blame others. That word in the Greek doesn't just mean to blame others. It means to blame fate. We blame fate. In other words, oh, it just happened. I was in the wrong place at the wrong time. And so we have a tendency to blame others or we blame fate. And it says they always do the evil things they want to do. They brag about themselves and the only reason they say good things about other people is to get what they want. One of the things I learned a long time ago is when people do things that are ungodly or evil or say horrible things about other people, they do so because it's in their heart too. That's what it says here. They always do the evil things they want to do. But we have a tendency to blame everyone else for our sin in life. Here's the second thing we do. We can run from it. A lot of people try to run from sin. I've tried to run from sin. Have you tried to run from sin? You can run, but you can't hide. And the scripture here tells us in Proverbs chapter 28, verse 1, the wicked are edgy with guilt, ready to run off, even when no one is after them. They're just on edge all of the time. They have this desire to run. Circle that word run. That word run in the Hebrew is the word noose, N-U-S. It means literally to vanish, to escape, to try to hide. And so they are edgy with guilt, ready to run off, even when no one is after them. Honest people are relaxed and confident, bold as lions. You ever sit in a room with somebody and somebody's always edgy, always on the 
age, they're ready to run. You know, there's something wrong with that. It has to do with guilt. Number three, when you and I have sin that we've been caught in, we can rationalize it. We just rationalize it. I read this morning uh, uh, in a note that came from one of the archbishops of the Church of England that he had made a declaration that he believed that that sin, especially the sin of adultery, which is the one that's mentioned here, especially the sin of adultery, has to do with the chromosomal makeup of an individual. Seems to me I remember some Pharisees back a long time ago trying to do the same thing. Amen? You try and take sin and minimize it. We rationalize it. It's not my fault. And so we look at it and we rationalize it. In Proverbs 21, verses 2 through 4, the Scripture says, You may think that everything you do is right, but remember the Lord judges your what? Your motives. You might be doing something. You might say it's not illegal. It's not really wrong. But the Lord judges our motives in the things that we do. And he goes on to say this. Wicked people are controlled by their conceit and their what? Arrogance. Arrogant people rationalize everything. Everybody, How many times, how many parents here, your kid comes home from school and says, everybody's doing it. That's another guy that lived at my house. Everybody's doing it. Nonetheless... We try to rationalize. They are controlled by their conceit and their arrogance, and this is sinful. Number four, we can cover it up. We can cover it up. Uh, To cover something up, just to lay over, to try and let others not see it. In Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 8, The scripture tells us something about the nature of salvation itself. It says, it is by God's grace that you have been saved through faith. It is not the result of your own efforts. One of the things that implies is that it is not your own efforts that can cover or conquer sin in your life. Did you know that? You can't do it. You cannot cover your sin. I want to read to you a a couple of passages of scripture. We look at this, and there are two times when it's appropriate to cover sin. Did you know that? There are two times when it's appropriate to cover sin. But you cannot cover your own sin. Say that with me. You cannot cover your own sin. Say it again. You cannot cover your own sin. But let me tell you what you can do. You can cover the sins of others. Did you know that? Write this down. James chapter 5 and verse 20. In James chapter 5 and verse 20, the scripture says, Brothers and sisters, you know, if somebody wanders off, if somebody's not living for the Lord, if somebody's caught in the act, remember this. Whoever turns a sinner from the way of error will save them from death and cover over A multitude of sins. Do you know, when you and I have a situation where a brother or sister in Christ is caught in sin, we're not supposed to condemn them and point a finger at them. We need to help cover that sin. And the only way you cover that sin is through redemption. If they do not know Jesus Christ, they need to come to know Jesus Christ. And by doing so, you have covered a multitude of sins. The second thing they do is they can be forgiven of those sins If they repent and come before the Lord, He will forgive their sins. And we need to remember that. So that's the first instance. You and I can cover someone else's sin. Let me tell you what not covering someone's sin is. Gossip. Gossip is not covering your brother's sin. Gossip is not doing that. But you and I, we can keep our mouth shut But we can talk to them privately and individually and we can bring them back to a point of redemption where they find forgiveness and grace and mercy in Jesus Christ. And then it's appropriate to cover someone's sin. Here's the second one. It's found in 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse 8. In 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse 8, the scripture says this. 
above all, love each other deeply because love covers a multitude of sins. I love the story in the Bible in the Old Testament about Noah. You all know about Noah? Well, the Bible tells us that after they had landed and they had a number of grapes that had been growing and so forth, and so they decided to make some wine, or they had gathered some wine that had been in the ark for quite a while, and it had fermented. And they took this wine, and, and the Bible tells us that, uh, that Noah drank the wine and became drunk. And his tent was open. And he was laying there for all the world to see, but naked. And the Bible says that two of his sons, Shem and Han, they went and they got a blanket. And they took it in their hands and backed up into the tent and gently laid it over their father to cover his shame. We have become a church who wants to flaunt the shame. We want to point out where everyone has failed. We want to point out all the mistakes that people have made in their lives. But what we really need to do is we need to cover it up. Amen? I'm not talking about sweeping it under the rug. I'm talking about loving someone and not looking at that sin anymore. There are people sitting right in this room that have things that they have been deeply ashamed for in their lives. I'm one of them. And you probably are too. But no one brings it up. You know why? Because we love one another. Love is the thing that covers a multitude of sins. That's the reason that the, prince, the prostitute can become a princess. That the drunkard can become a man of God. That's the reason that all of these things that happen in our lives, they happen in such a way that the love will cover the multitude of sins. But you cannot cover your own sins. You can't do it. It'll never happen. You can try to hide it, but I got news for you. There's one who sees everything. He sees everything. The last thing is this. We can face up to it. We can face up to it. <coughs> There's a passage in Psalm 32 at the beginning. <coughs> talks about the nature of sin and how there are transgressions where that's where we cross a forbidden line. There is sin itself, which is a condition that we bear that we fall short of everything that God intended for us. And then the Scripture uses the term that we would find to be guilt and guilt associated with sin. It's called iniquity. Anytime you see the word iniquity in the Old Testament, it means guilt. Guilt of either crossing a forbidden line or the guilt of our sinful nature. We find ourselves guilty. And then it says, Blessed is the man whom the Lord does not give a guilty conscience. Blessed is that man. But here in this passage, David writes, there was a time when I wouldn't admit what a sinner I was. Anybody been there? I would not admit what a sinner I was. But my dishonesty made me miserable and filled my days with frustration. All day and all night your hand was heavy on me. My strength evaporated like water on a sunny day until I finally admitted all my sins to you and stopped trying to what? Hide them. I said to myself, I will confess. I've got that underlined for you. Circle that word confess. I will confess them to the Lord and you forgave me. And then it says, all my iniquity, all my guilt is gone. Gone. It doesn't exist anymore. The word confess there in both the Hebrew and in the Greek has the same basic meaning. It means to be in agreement with God. 
You're not telling him anything that he doesn't already know. He already knows everything about you. That's the reason one of my favorite passages of Scripture in the Bible is 1 John 3.20. 1 John 3.20 set me free from the bondage of guilt in my life at one point where I was able to hold my head back up and I was able to be exactly what God wanted me to be where I stopped groveling and hiding and rationalizing and explaining things away. If my heart condemns me, God is greater than my heart and knows all things. And it set me free. It was like a light bulb went off in my mind. And what it really means is this. And I'm going to tell you the Pastor Howard version. The Pastor Howard version is this. Jesus knows everything in the world there is to know about me. And He still loves me. He knows things about me that even I don't know about me. And He still loves me. And it began to set me free in my mind and my heart because I realized that there was nothing I could do to make God love me any more. But there was nothing I could do to make God love me any less. And I found myself at that point of freedom. My guilt was gone. And I was able to stand up and move forward in my life. And dear friend, that may be you today. You need to stand up and start moving forward instead of moving backward. So, this woman, she was in a trap, and Jesus was in a trap, caught between a rock and a hard place. In this context, we look at these Pharisees. They ushered this woman into the midst of this crowd and set Jesus up right there on a pedestal, and they got Him as they had already gotten her. Between a rock and a hard place. You ever been between a rock and a hard place? (laughs) This is where it is. Let's look first of all at the rock. Now here's the rock. In John chapter 1, when we first started this book in verse 17, you don't have that up on the screen, but in John chapter 1, in verse 17, it says this, Now the law came by Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. The law came from Moses, but grace and truth came from Jesus Christ. And John was drawing a contrast early in the book to see how this legalistic law, thou shalt not, thou shalt not, thou shalt not, thou shalt not, compared with, I love you. He's going to draw that contrast. The rock that Jesus found himself in this situation with was this woman. In John chapter 8, verses 4 to 6, they came to Jesus and they called Him teacher. This woman was caught in the act of adultery. That meant that they had actually walked in, seen her, there were witnesses. You could not accuse anyone except by the hand of two or three witnesses. So it was two or three people that saw them. And I'm wondering what they were doing watching. There are a couple of questions that come to mind in this event. That was the first one. Why were they watching? Now they said, in the law, they probably said, in the law, Moses commanded us to stone such women. Notice they didn't say God said. They said, Moses said. Moses said for us to stone such women. That's the real danger here. And the the Pharisees and these lawmakers, they fell into the same trap. They began to worship this instead of Him. Did you know you can do that? There are people out there today that worship this. They worship even a certain version of this. It has become their all in all. And if you don't carry the same Bible they do, and you don't speak the same Bible that they speak, then they have fallen into the trap of idolatry. And idolatry is placing anything or anyone ahead of God Himself. And they put Moses ahead of God. Hey, just because Moses wrote those first five books of the Bible, you need to remember something. That God is the one who gave him the words to write. And so in the context of that, They said, Moses commands us to stone such women. Now, what do you say? What do you say? 
And the scripture goes on to say they were using this question as a trap in order to have a basis for accusing him. But we've got to be careful not to walk into a trap. And that's exactly what was taking place here. In Deuteronomy chapter 22 and verse 22 is the passage that they were referring to. If a man is discovered having sexual relations with another man's wife, both the man who had sex with the woman and the woman must die. You must purge the evil from Israel. Now my second question, where's the guy? You see, in that culture, they believed it was perfectly acceptable for a man to have multiple sexual relationships with individuals. That a man could not be charged with adultery, but that only a woman could be charged with adultery. That's a little lopsided, isn't it? Here's the hard place. We've got the rock and the hard place. Now, if you have your notes there in front of you, let me read this to you. Under Roman law, capital punishment was the sole right of the Roman governors and could only be administered by them. That's the reason that Jesus had to appear before Pontius Pilate, because Pontius Pilate was the only one who had the authority to put him to death. Okay? To stone another without Roman approval was an act of sedition and made you enemies of Rome. To turn the woman over to the governor for punishment would have been viewed as an act of submission to an invading enemy by the Jewish people. And so here he is. He's stuck. He's between a rock and a hard place. Yeah, the law says to do this, but they live under a Roman rule. And either way he answers this, if he sends them to Pilate, he's committing an act of sedition against the people of Israel. And if he says, go ahead and stone her, he's committing an act of sedition against Roman rule. Either way, he ends up being crucified for his sin. Remember what he had just told his brothers? It is not yet my time. John chapter 8 and verse 6, the scripture says, they were using this question as a trap in order to have a basis for accusing him but Jesus bent down and started to write on the ground with his finger. You ever wonder what Jesus was writing? Huh? I've heard a lot of theories. I've heard some people say he was just drawing pictures, stalling, gaining time to think of something to say. I don't believe that. I don't believe that for one minute. Then there's another one that said he was writing down the names of all the people who were there. And who cares? The scripture doesn't show them. Why would they be written in the, in the sand? And some of them said he was writing the sins of those uh, who were in the crowd. And then one guy he put in there, he said, I hope he was writing the names of the women that the men had committed adultery with over the last year. <laughs> I don't know if that was true either. But what I do know is there is a singular reference in the Scripture that talks about the wickedness of men and them being written in dust. Look at this. In Jeremiah chapter 17 and verse 13, the Scripture says, O Lord, the hope of Israel, all who forsake you will be put to shame. These Pharisees, lawyers, scribes, they had forsaken God. Remember what Jesus said about them? You brood of vipers. You hypocrites. You know neither God nor His Word. And in that context, this says this. Those who turn away from you will be written in the dust. Because they have forsaken the Lord, the spring of living water. What had He just told them He was? He was the spring of of living water. I, in my heart, want to believe that Jesus wrote this verse of Scripture. They were the ones who knew the Word of God. If He wrote this verse of Scripture down, and He wrote it out there right in front of them, ooh. And the Holy Spirit's right there to convict. What a change that would have made. 
the truth. Regardless of what Jesus wrote, it was truth. And so the truth, the scripture says, will set you free. Continuing in verse 7, it says, When they kept on questioning him, he straightened up and said to them, If any one of you is without sin, circle that word for sin. This is a very unusual word for sin. Matter of fact, this is the only place in the entire Bible this word is used. All right? This word for sin is the word anamartitos. It's the only place it's used. Anamartitos is an unusual word for sin. It means sinless, without fault. It means that you are unerring in your life. Uh, It literally means you are incapable of committing sin. Only place this is ever used. And Jesus turns around them and said, Are you guys incapable of even committing a sin in your life? Are you individuals who are unerring in anything that you do? And then the scripture says, For the second time, He stooped down and wrote on the ground. Now this time I have no idea what he wrote. But he had just asked them if any of them was sinless. I don't know what he wrote, but it had a profound effect on them. As he stooped down and wrote on the ground, at this those who heard began to go away one at a time. And then here's the key. The older ones first until only Jesus was left. This is the point where I believe he may have directed at individuals. I don't know what he was writing, but the scripture tells us that it began with the oldest person there. Let's talk about you, Fred. Fred left. Let's talk about you, William. Okay. Let's talk about you, Levi. And one by one, the Scripture says, they all left. Let me tell you something if you don't know it yet. Jesus has got your number. And if you don't know Jesus Christ, that ought to frighten you to death. But if you do know Him, it ought to make you proud. Because He loves you in spite of who you are. And so the Scripture says... There was only Jesus left and the woman still standing there. The illustration of this story tells us three specific things. Number one, you are not alone in your sin. There are a lot of people that think they're all alone in their sin. There are a lot of people that experience shame and hardship and pain. I've been there. You say things to yourself like, I can't believe I did that. Why did I do that? Why did I even allow this to happen? I can't believe those I let down. I can't believe the circumstances that I allowed myself to be caught into. You understand? We've all been in those situations. And it can be something as innocuous as having a parent walk in your room when you're looking at something or not doing something you should have been doing or you're blatantly disobedient or to the horror of this example that's found in the Scripture. But nonetheless... We need to understand that we are not alone in our sin. I'm going to give you two words of advice. Number one, don't be overly depressed about your sin. You and I don't need to be overly depressed about our sin as believers in Jesus Christ. Now, I'm talking to believers here. You don't need to be overly depressed about your sin. Let me give you a passage of Scripture here. Let's look at it. In Romans it says, Obviously the law applies to those for whom it was given. All right? The Jewish people, stubborn lot of people. God said, you, you're stubborn. You don't want to live by grace. As a matter of fact, that's the reason we have the Ten Commandments. I don't know if you're aware of this. But in the Old Testament, there was an event that took place. And <clears throat> the people had decided that Moses had taken too much on him. That they didn't want him to be in charge. They didn't want him to be in control. That they thought, and they approached him with their openly mature motives. And they said, let us help you. You shouldn't have to take all of this on yourself. Let's get people from each of the 12 tribes and and we'll let them help you with all of the management of this nation. Well, long and short of it, two things happened. 
Number one, God said to them, and these were His words, He said specifically, you have chosen not to live by my grace and my mercy. I've been displaying grace. I've been displaying mercy through my servant Moses. But you have chosen not to do that. Therefore, since you choose not to live by grace and mercy, I will give you my law. Did you know that? That's where the law came from. And so there he gave Moses these Ten Commandments, to which the Jewish leaders added 470 more to them. That became known as the Talmud. And so the first thing that happened was they had to live by the law. Here's the law. Thou shalt not. Thou shalt not. You understand? Went down through all these lists of things. And the second thing that happened is they ended up wandering in the wilderness for 40 years because of their blatant disobedience to the grace and the mercy of God and His law. And so we look at this we understand we don't need to be overly depressed about our sin. He says, obviously, a law applies to those for whom it was given for its purpose. This is the purpose of the law, the Ten Commandments. This is the purpose. Was to keep people from having excuses and to show the entire world is guilty before God. Wow! That's what the Ten Commandments are about. You don't have any excuse. You can't stand before God and say, look at me, I'm good. No, you're not. For no one can be made right with God by doing what the law commands. How many people can be made right with God by obeying the Ten Commandments? No one. And yet I still see signs up along the side of the road. Obey the Ten Commandments. You can't. Even the knothead that put the sign up can't do it. (coughs) He says here, No one can be made right with God by doing what the law commands. The law simply shows us how sinful we are. But now God has shown us a way to be made right with Him without keeping the requirements of the law as was promised in the writings of Moses and the prophets long ago. We are made right with God by placing our faith in Jesus Christ. And this is true for everyone who believes. How many? Everyone who believes, no matter who we are, for everyone has sinned and we fall short of God's glorious standard. <clears throat> At a funeral service, I'll usually read that passage in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, where it simply says there that you and I, we have sinned. And it says that, oh death, where is your sting? Oh grave, where is your victory? And it says this, the sting of sin is death and the power of sin is the law. Do you know why you feel guilty when you commit a sin? Because somebody bothered to teach you the Ten Commandments. Did you know that? That's the reason we teach children the Ten Commandments. Not so they can live by them, but so when they get old like us, comes right back into the heart and mind because Scripture says the Word never returns void. It's there. And you've been taught the difference between what is right and wrong and you now have no excuse for your sin. That's why. That's why. So, don't get too depressed about your sin. It's been forgiven. It's been covered. You don't live by the law anymore. Do you understand? Then at the end of that statement, oh grave, where is your, you know, yeah. He said this, thanks be to God for the victory that is ours in Christ Jesus. We have victory through Christ. So don't be overly depressed about your sin. Number two, don't be overly impressed about your sin. You say, what do you mean by that? Some people go off a deep end. I'm the worst sinner ever. I've committed the most horrible sin. <laughs> you know, and they boohoo, and, and it goes on and on. You ever seen people like that? 
just goes on. Don't be impressed with your sin. Your sin is... I don't care what it was. 1 Corinthians 10, 13. The only temptations that you have are the temptations that all people have. But you can trust God. He will not let you be tempted more than you can stand. But when you are tempted, God will also give you a way to escape that temptation. Then you will be able to stand it. So don't get too impressed with yourself. You blew it. You understand? Don't get overly depressed. Don't get overly impressed with your sin. Because you're not alone. There's a host of others that are in the same boat. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Number two, you are not condemned for your sin. You are not condemned for your sin. This is important. Remember I said earlier that Jesus said, in our, the passage said in John chapter 1 verse 17 said, by the, law, the law came by Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. There's a significant difference between the terror of the law. And the law is terror. You did this wrong. You did that wrong. You didn't do this and you were supposed to do it. The law holds with it a sense of terror. But the power of grace and truth can set you free from that law and all that it represents. The Scripture tells us that we are not condemned for our sin. Here in this passage, continuing in verse 10, after Jesus had noticed that it was just Him and her, He straightened up and asked her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? No one, sir, she said. Then neither do I condemn you. Jesus declared, now go and leave your life of sin. Now I want you to circle that word condemn. Now the word condemn there in the Greek is the word katakrino. Katakrino has two primary elements of truth associated with it. The first of these is legal truth. All right. Now katakrino is a legal term that can mean that legally you have been judged and sentence has been passed upon you. It's just cut and dried. Here it is. That's the law. You broke it. That's it. That's just a penalty for it. Okay? But there's another side. The moral law. Now, the moral aspect of this particular word, catacrino, means to judge someone to be worthless. You have judged someone to be worthless. You have judged them to be less than other people. As a matter of fact, the same word, catacrino, could be used to deal with things. For example, what if you had a building that was condemned? What do they do to a condemned building? They tear it down. When you say that you are under condemnation, when someone points a finger at you and condemns you, when they tell you all the horrible things that you have done, what they've essentially said to you is you're worthless or really you're worth less than me. That's what they're saying. Jesus never says that. Jesus never calls you worthless. He never says you're less. He always says you're more. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Amen? I am declared a child of the King. But as many as received Him, to them gave He power to become the sons of the living God. And so Jesus never diminishes us. And you need to understand something. As many people like to point a condemning finger at someone else and want to point a finger and point out all the things that are wrong with someone else, let me tell you something. Condemnation is not the cure for sin. And we need to remember that politically too. Amen? The reason that there's so much conflict in our country is not because of politics. It's because of sin. And condemnation is not the cure for sin. The only cure for sin is Jesus. So when we look at this in Romans 8 verses 1 and 2, the Scripture goes on to tell us a little bit more about this. It says, No condemnation now hangs over the head of those who are in Jesus Christ. At the first of the year, I'm going to be going through the book of Ephesians on Wednesday nights. 
And on Wednesday nights, as we go through the book of Ephesians, the theme of the book of Ephesians is in Christ. And we're going to be going through that. By the way, I've noticed that some of you have stopped watching on Wednesday nights. Yes, I'm just like Santa Claus. I can tell who's been naughty and who's been nice. I just don't know the names. Now, that I've heaped that condemnation on you, which will not cure the sin. No condemnation now hangs over the head of those who are in Christ Jesus for the new spiritual principle of life in Christ. Lift me out of the old vicious circle of sin and death. The law never succeeded in producing righteousness. The failure was always the weakness of human nature and all God's people said... We are weak. But God has met this by sending His own Son, Jesus Christ, to live in that human nature which caused the trouble. And while Christ was actually taking upon Himself the sins of men, God condemned the sinful nature. God doesn't condemn you as an individual. God condemns the sinful nature that controls you. And the more that we begin to understand this valid biblical truth, the more we are set free. And Jesus said, if I set you free, you are free indeed. So in the context of that, so that we are able to meet the law's requirements, so long as we are living no longer by the dictates of our sinful nature or by the law, but we're living by the Spirit of God. So first of all, We're not alone. Secondly, we're not condemned. Third, we are responsible for our sin. Just because we're not condemned doesn't mean we're not responsible. Okay? Do you see what Jesus said to the woman? He said, neither do I condemn you. Now go and leave your life of sin. The reason that we're responsible for our sin is because of grace. God says, I forgave you. I gave you my grace, my free gift of eternal life. I gave you forgiveness of all of your sin. Why would you go back into it? And yet we do time and time and time. Am I right? But the reason being, we're responsible for our sin because of grace. If you've never received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you don't have that same responsibility that a believer has. You're just living in sin. But when you and I are in this situation, we have drugged the Holy Spirit into that sin with us. And we're responsible for our sin because of the grace of God that is in our life. 1 John 1. If we say we have no sin, we are only fooling ourselves and refusing to accept the truth. But if we confess our sins. There's that word confess again. It means to agree with God. If we confess our sins to Him, He can be depended on to forgive us and cleanse us from every wrong. By the way, He's talking to believers, not unbelievers. And it is perfectly proper for God to do this for us because Christ died to wash away our sins. And if we claim we have not sinned, we are lying and calling God a liar. For He says, we have sinned. We all sin. Do you remember when Jesus gathered the disciples in the upper room just before they were to uh, have the Last Supper, which was the Passover meal. Right before the meal, they had these preliminaries that took place before. And then right before the meal, Scripture says Jesus got up from a table and He took a towel and He wrapped it around Himself. And, of course, the disciples are all laid out there and the table is obviously moved away at this point. And Jesus begins at one end and then He works His way all the way to the other. And He begins to take a basin of water and He washes their feet they're in horror Uh what is he doing what is he doing gets down to peter peter said you're not washing my feet and jesus said if i don't wash you you're not clean and then peter says well don't just wash my feet then wash all of me he was a goofball i can relate (laughs) jesus said i have already made you clean But as you walk through this life, 
as you walk through this life, you're still in the midst of sin and you get dirty. Amen? We still pick up dust. We still pick up that sin in our lives. Some of us have got sin all the way up to our chin. But we walk through life and we have that sin because we live in a sinful world. And he said, you need to have your feet cleansed on a regular basis. And not only that, he told them, you need to wash each other's feet. Which is the implication of meaning, you need to forgive others. When he had taught them how to pray, he said, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And so in the context of this, he's telling them, you need to make sure that you confess your sin and be cleansed. That's what this is reference to. He cleanses us. Keep short accounts. When you sin, immediately confess it. Immediately get right with God. And then go on with your life. In Romans 2 and verse 4, there are those that say, well, how come they get away with it? How come God hasn't done anything to them? They just continue to live in that sinful state. You ever wonder that? Romans 2 and verse 4 says, Don't you realize how patient He is being with you? Or don't you care? Can't you see that He has been waiting all this time without punishing you to give you time to turn from your sin? His kindness is meant to lead you to repentance. Wow, what a powerful statement. How do we leave a life of sin? How do we leave a life of sin? There was one thing that continued through this eighth day of this Feast of Tabernacles. On this Feast of Tabernacles, on this last day, it was a day of Sabbath. They were still in their booths. Some of them were beginning to make the move home, but they still came and worshipped at the temple. And in the temple, that last night... They did what they had done every night before, with the exception of the water. And in the temple area, as they had gathered together there, they had huge pillars that were set up in the midst of the outer courtyard of the temple. And on the top of those towers were candles. That was a Jewish custom to use the menorahs, candlesticks. But we know from reading Josephus and other Jewish historians from the time period that they had so many lights up that it illuminated everything. There was hardly any place you could go in the temple area, whether it be the women's court, the court of the Gentiles, whether it be in the men's court, it did not make any difference. There was hardly any place you could go that it wasn't lit up brightly like daylight in the middle of the night. In the middle of the night. The implication being that they wanted to remind the people about the Shekinah glory cloud that once rested over the temple. It was a pillar of fire by night and it was like having daylight in the midst of the temple at all times. And so here, that night as Jesus had dealt with this woman and addressed them, we know what had transpired this evening. Because a little bit earlier, before they brought him to her. The scripture says, Then Jesus addressed them saying, I am the light of the world. And he who follows me will not walk in darkness. He will enjoy the light of life. You see, Jesus is the glory. He is the glory. He had told them He was the bread of life. He had told them He was the water, the springs of life. And now He tells them He is the light of the world. He did all these things. Psalm 27 and verse 1, if you don't know it, it says, The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? Whom shall I fear? Many years ago, when Dwight L. Moody was 
getting to the point where he was ready to retire. He could no longer maintain the arduous aspects of maintaining the college and the, the Moody Bible Institute and other things that were there. He decided that he would select a man to take his place. And it was a man who had been there in their midst, one of the teachers at the uh, Moody Bible Institute. His name was R.A. Torrey. I don't know if you ever heard of R.A. Torrey. But R.A. Torrey was a wonderful man of God, but he was a little strict. He wasn't like D.L. Moody. <laughs> he was a little strict. He, he ruled with a rod of iron. He was very, very, very strict. He got a letter one day from a, a distraught father there in Chicago area. And uh, Mr. Newell was his name. And he wrote to R.A. Torrey about his son. That his son, as a young man, had fallen in debauchery. Uh, he had gotten into drunkenness. He was hanging with lewd women. He was just doing the most horrible of things. And was on his way to go to jail. You know, that's how bad he had gotten. And growing up in a Christian home, the father couldn't believe how this how this young man had, had lived his life in such a horrible way. And he wrote to, to Dr. Torrey and said, if you'll just take him into the Moody Bible Institute, I know you can straighten him out. R.A. Torrey wrote back and said, we're not a reform school. The father wrote him again. Same reply, sent it back. The father wrote him again. He wrote him over and over and over to the point where R.A. Torrey said, Fine, send him over here and we'll see what we can do. So the young man comes reluctantly into the Moody Bible Institute because if he doesn't, he has no money, he's cut off. You understand? It's just a bad situation for this young man. And uh, Billy was his name. Billy Newell. And Billy didn't go to the classes. He could care less about the classes. So Dr. Torrey had him come and meet with him in his office. And he said, since you won't go to the classes, I want you to meet with me every day. And Dr. Torrey just began to meet with him on a daily basis. And he did come to that. Dr. Torrey showed him the Word of God, prayed with him, then sent him on his way every day. Same thing, reluctantly, arrogant, proud, rebellious, coming into their presence. One day, the Word of God got through all of the vibrato. And young Billy Newell accepted Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior. This man who was on a delinquent trail to become a horrible man found Jesus Christ. From that day forward, he began to attend the classes. He began to grow and learn to the point where young Billy Newell became Dr. William Newell and actually taught at the Moody Bible Institute. And one day, when asked about his testimony of coming to Christ, he reflected back on the path that he had seen himself going down. And he wrote these words. Years I spent in vanity and pride, caring not my Lord was crucified, knowing not it was for me he died on Calvary. Mercy there was great and grace was free. Pardon there was multiplied to me. 
There my burdened soul found liberty at Calvary. Father, I praise you and I thank you for your love. I thank you for forgiveness of sin, for grace unmerited, for hope eternal, and for love never ending. May you watch over all of us. May you encourage each heart. And may you, our Heavenly Father, set free those who are still in bondage to sin. May you deliver them that they would truly understand that there is no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. May they be set free from the law and embrace grace. Thank you, Lord, for your promise and your gift. Dear one, if you're here today or you're watching online and You don't know for certain if you died that you'd go to heaven, but you'd like to know. The scripture says, Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord and believe in their heart that God the Father has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. And so if you'd like to receive Christ right now, if you'd like to know you can go to heaven, pray this prayer with me just in the quietness of this moment in your heart. And just say, Lord Jesus, I come before you asking forgiveness. I believe that you died on the cross for me and that you shed your precious blood to cleanse me from all of my sin. And I need to be made clean. And I believe, Lord Jesus, when they took you down from that cross, they laid you in a borrowed tomb. And three days later, You just miraculously and powerfully rose from the dead so that I can have a home in heaven with you one day. And if you have the power to do that, you certainly have the power to save me. And so, Lord Jesus, will you come into my heart and my life? Will you be my Savior to forgive me of my sin? Will you be my Lord to lead me in all the decisions of life? And will you be my friend to walk with me, not just on this earth, but to walk the streets of glory one day? And dear one, if you prayed that prayer and you meant it with all of your heart, if you're here in this room, no one else is looking around, just me. Would you lift your eyes and catch mine? Would you do that? I prayed that prayer. God bless you. God bless you. Maybe online you prayed with me. Would you just let someone know? There's probably someone in your life, a born-again believer, a family member, a co-worker, a neighbor, a friend. You know that they love Jesus. Let them know today that you accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior. And if you don't have anybody you can share it with, send it to me. Just let me know, Pastor Howard, at familyofgodcc.com, and I'll rejoice with you. Father, may your blessings rest upon all of these who have lifted their eyes, not unto me, but unto you. May you encourage each heart and give us your glory this day. For we ask it in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, Amen. Let's all stand together as we sing a closing song.
to you. Amen. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. And may the Lord lift his countenance upon you to watch you wherever you may go. And as you leave this place today, go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.